Good morning and welcome to Life Church. We're so glad that you joined us today. Before our service gets started, we'd like to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. If you are visiting with us for the first time, welcome. We'd love to connect with you and there are a couple ways we can do that. There are connection signs with QR codes posted throughout the church. Scan the QR code with your smartphone to access our digital connect card. You will find physical connection cards in the seat backs in front of you. We can't wait to get to know you. For returning guests and members, you can also use the digital or physical connect cards to be added to our email list. This helps you stay up to date with announcements and events happening at Life Church. Our next women's ministry Bible study will be Monday, July 25th, starting at 6 p.m. They will be going through session five in the book, Raised Together, a study through the book of Colossians. This will also be a dessert night, so bring a dessert to share. You do not have to have the book or have been to previous studies to attend. Make plans to be there and bring a friend. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you have a great time here at Life Church. Let me invite you to stand as we worship the Lord together in song this morning as we praise him and just give him thanks for the hope that we have only in Jesus. It's only found in Jesus, amen? Let's sing this together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. Inspiration, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Christ, my living hope. And who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin. cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope, sing hallelujah. Think about it. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Yeah. Jesus 
Before you have a seat, let me invite you to turn and greet those around you, especially if it's somebody you haven't met before. Let them know you're glad to see them today. Good morning. How you guys doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, my name is Dennis Tony, um, and it is just such an honor to be here this morning and, and uh, to be uh, a member of Life Church. My better half and uh, our better half are in the children's ministry right now. They're probably blowing bubbles, uh, living the dream. Um, uh, and just want to say thank you guys for being here uh, in person. Uh, and thank you guys online for tuning in. Um, and what an honor it is. Um, this morning, I want to uh, just kind of talk to you guys about, um, I guess, the, the, the word desperate. Um, this week, um, for a little bit now, um, for whatever the reason, uh, the word desperate has kind of been a thing, um, but to compliment 
the word desperate. Uh, hope has also kind of uh, meshed well with desperate. Um, so uh, text-wise, want to bring you to Mark 2, 1 through 4. If you don't get the, the end of that, where the Lord just pretty much says, my child, your sins are forgiven. You don't, you don't get that, but I just gave it to you anyways. So, how many this morning uh, believe or have heard that we're living in desperate times? You know, I mean, for, for the seasoned people, I won't say the, the O word, uh, you know, if you guys are saying it, it must have been been saying for a while now, right? So you see it or hear it on the news. You see it in the streets a lot. Um, well, even if you're in certain areas, you see it at the stop sign or the red light. Um, if you still, once again, for you seasoned veterans, if you still get the paper, I'm sure you somehow still see it there as well. I don't remember the last time I've seen a newspaper, unfortunately. I do miss playing those games. Yeah. Those are great. So, if you are not at this present moment, you have been at some point, or you will at some point in life, experience a moment of desperation for something or even someone. A little short excerpt. Uh, I was so desperate for my wife, I told her, hey, I ain't getting on a knee, but if you don't marry me, I'm jumping off this bridge. Right? She said, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I did not do that. I did not. <laughs> That, that would be a red flag, ladies. <laughs> You're like, this dude's crazy. Hey, no, no, that ain't worth it. So the dictionary defines desperate. Uh, one, it's an adjective. I'm a math teacher. I was like, adjective, what's up? Uh, it's, it describes something, right? So it says, it's a feeling showing or involving a hopeless sense that a situation is so bad as to be impossible to deal with. Uh, or it says, tried in despair, or when everything else has failed, having little hope of success. Or extremely bad, serious, or dangerous. Um, a sentence that went along with this, which is very fitting. There is a desperate shortage of teachers sad Fortunate. but the good news is there is hope and we love hope so Mark 2 1 through 4 as I read it and if you are able to stand as I read uh, the word the living word the truth the absolute truth and nothing but the truth. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. You know, when you're back home and you're like, yeah, Deton is back home. The boys come in, right? That's what happened. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors, family, Folks, people don't even know. No more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on the mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on a mat right down in front of Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to just share your word and talk through it and, and break it down and 
uh, share what you have shared with me with so many others. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and just keep us safe. In your name we pray. Amen.
truth. Our sins are many, but his mercy is more. His mercy is abundant. His mercy is sufficient. It covers all our sins. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers us. As Pastor Nolan comes to preach a message called Have Mercy, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts through your word this morning. And that you would reveal yourself in a new way today through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, if you love Jesus, put your hands together this morning. Let's thank him. Hallelujah. Thank you for that mercy. It is a beautiful day that God has made and created, and we get to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm thankful for all of your faces being in the place today. And those that couldn't be here, there's a lot of folks dealing with sickness and all kind of things. And so we think about them, we pray for them. And uh, just thank God for another morning together in worship as we sing the word of God, as we preach the word of God. And we're going to talk about his mercy this morning. No better topic than to look into other than to observe the mercy of God. I do want to say next week we have plans to be on our property um, in Oconee County, so we'll have that address posted on social media. It should be on the website as well. So make plans to be there unless the weather changes its mind or it's too hot. We'll come back here in the AC. I know y'all were cool with that last time. Um, so I know y'all spoiled jokers. Um, but anyway, yeah. So that's our plan is to be on the property, but we will let you know if we will not be there instead. I'm going to pray because there is a word from the Lord this morning. Father God, we thank you. Once again, God, we stand here on the edge of, of time. God, in these seats, God, listening by way of stream. Father, we're here. We got up this morning. We got dressed. We got here. And God, you want to do some business with us today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for the gathering of the saints and even the gathering of some here that might not know you this morning. God, when we leave here, I pray that salvation would be evident, Father, that it would be known, that it would be the tug of the heart that is not yet regenerated, God, that you would save somebody today, snatch them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. God, do it this morning. We ask for the Holy Spirit, God, to make the word plain. God, to communicate through me. Father, hide me behind the cross. God, may you be exalted in this moment and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, go to Psalms 51. Uh, this is the next to last psalm that we're going to preach for the summer. Then we're going to jump back into a book study starting here uh, in August. And so I hope you've enjoyed this summer in the Psalms. And we're going to press on through Psalms 51 this morning. Psalms 51. Now let me set up the context for you. So in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see this story about this guy named David. And we know that David wrote a, a huge chunk of the Psalms. He didn't write all of the Psalms, but he wrote a good number of the Psalms. But in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we have this story that is being set up. And David is being described here, and it says this. In the spring of the year, the time came when kings go out to battle. David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. The first thing that we see that is a concern to us, and it should be a concern, is the fact that we see that kings were meant to go out to battle during this time. During this particular season, the scripture tells us that, that the kings were to go out and to fight. It was wartime, it was battle time. They were supposed to go with their armies. But what do we see happening at the onset of 2 Samuel chapter 11? David decides to send his army, but he doesn't go with them. David decides, I'm going to chill at home. I'm going to send my guys out, and I know we can win this battle. It's, 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 it's easy as cake, man. Our, our army is stronger than theirs, and the Bible says that they demolished them. It was light work. And David probably knew that. He had them trained up. David's a man of war. And he says, I'm just going to stay back. I know I'm supposed to be with my guys. 
I'm supposed to be busy, but instead I'm going to stay home. And as a result of David staying home, we get this story that unfolds. The Bible tells us that David, he woke up one morning, he wakes up from a, a nap, and, and, and he's got his cloak on, and he decides to go to, to the roof, to the edge of his house. And I've described this to you before, but where David's house was placed, it was inside the city walls, but it was to the south of Jerusalem, and the apex of Jerusalem was at the top to where it could oversee the rest of the city. So pretend that I am on the top of David's house, which means that when I look out, I can look down. And the scripture describes that David, he gets up and he goes to the edge of his house and he's able to look down and he sees something with his eyes. The Bible says that he sees this young lady. She's on her roof, 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 Lord, I can't even say the word, roof, and she's bathing. And in David's mind, the Commodore song starts playing. <laughs> she's a brick house. She's mighty, mighty, and she's letting it all hang out. <laughs> and he's sitting there looking, and his sin begins to grip his heart. And he says, man, she's pretty attractive. I'm going to have my guys go and get her and bring her to me. And the Bible describes that they go and they fetch Bathsheba, and she comes to David. And the scriptures say that she lays with David. She is a married woman, and David knows this. But David chooses to engage in this sin anyhow because his flesh has gripped his heart. The lust of his eyes have, have captured him, and he commits this egregious sin whenever he's actually supposed to be out at war doing what kings do, but he decides to stay home, and he finds himself in sin. And he lays with another man's wife, and he realizes, oh, man, I got to figure out how to cover this up. And he figures out that Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah. He's a Hittite, and he's one of David's best soldiers. He's actually a captain in David's army, and Uriah is a noble man. He's a man of character. He's a man of, of, of obviously, of, of, of having those qualities because he's a captain in David's army, and he's there fighting. And so David sends word and says, listen, I need you to go get my, my guy Uriah because i got to figure out how to cover up this, this, this trail. Because Bathsheba has came and told me that she's pregnant. Uh-oh. David, you are the father. And so he's got to figure out how to cover up this trail. And so he says, listen, I want you to have Uriah come back. And when he comes back, I'm going to tell Uriah, listen, man, take a little bit of a break, okay? Go home. Sleep with your wife. Bible says that Uriah being a man of character, he says, I cannot go and lay with my wife when my guys are out there fighting and, and they're out there warring and I'm sitting here comfortable. And the Bible says that he actually sleeps, sleeps with his servants. He sleeps next to his other guys and his guards at the gate. So David's like, man, this dude has just got too much character, right? So I got to get him drunk. So then maybe he'll go home and, and sleep with his wife. So he does, but Uriah still as a man of character says, I'm not going to go and be with my wife. So David has to come up with a plan C. And the plan C for David and Uriah is to have Uriah go to the front lines. Send them back to war. And the instructions that David gave to the rest of his guard was, you guys are going to withdraw back from him while he's fighting up front. And they follow out the orders of David. And guess what happens? Uriah is killed. He's killed in battle. So David is thinking, you know what? I've covered all the bases. I've covered up my trail of, of my actions. So everything should be good. You know, that was unfortunate how it happened. But it happened, so it is what it is. But then the Bible tells us that he's got a friend named Nathan. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the next verse over, this is what happens. And the Lord sent to Nathan to David. And he came to him and said, there were two men, he begins to tell this story, there were two men in a certain city. The one was rich and the other was poor. And the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and he grew it up and with him and with his children. And he used to eat of his morsels and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. And there came a traveler 
to the rich man, and, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and he prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. David gets mad at the guy in the story. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore that lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then Nathan looks to David and says, David, you are the man. You are the guy. Can you imagine how David's heart sinks in that very moment? Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and you've taken his wife to be your wife, and you've killed him. With the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of his son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. What a tragic story. And Psalms 51 is David's response to that moment. Psalms 51 is considered to be a penitential psalm. It is a psalm of repentance. It is David under the influence of godly sorrow. And this is where we pick up this morning in verse, verse 1 of chapter 51. David said this, have mercy on me, O God. Pause. This is the prayer of, of, of somebody who has has sinned, has committed sin, but they've also came to a place of stopping all self-justification. It's a direct confession without excuse. See, David asked for mercy, and mercy is equivalent to undeserved favor. It implies pity to the miserable, grace to the guilty. See, without the mercy of God, the good news is no longer good for us. It's actually quite horrific news for us. If we don't have the mercy of God. Our sins, they put us before the righteous judge. God, who is the righteous judge, they put us before him with no defense. And we're all helpless and hopeless without this mercy. But, but David knows that, that if mercy is to be found and to be applied to his case, it's got to be according to something outside of him that has nothing to do with him. So David, he appeals to the nature of God, and he says, God, have mercy on me according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. See, David, he, he wanted mercy, but it had to come from a source that had no conditions and no limitations on the grace that would be applied. He said, I've got to appeal to, to something that cannot fail, so the only thing that can rescue me in this moment it's something that has to do with the nature of God, and that goes into his, his covenant-keeping, steadfast love. I've taught you this word before, and it's this Hebrew word, Hebrew word hesed. It means his covenant-keeping love. David appeals to the covenant-keeping love of, of God, and he knows that his sin requires an unconditional love that's coated in abundant Mercy, and he says, this mercy has to blot out my transgressions. Now, when he says transgressions, he's talking about his sin, trespass, discontent, ingratitude, covetousness, hardness of heart, selfishness, pride, worldliness, unbelief, adultery, murder, everything that I just mentioned to you, David was guilty of. Every single one of them. 
And he says, God, what I need you to do is I need you to come and I need you to blot out my transgressions, that long list of sin that I just told you. He said, God, I need you to do something with that. And will you not just kind of, uh, uh, you know, just just rake over it to where it's, it's, it's somewhat gone and kind of gone. I need you to blot it out completely. And it's this idea of there being a, a charge against you or a charge in your ledger. And it's actually got this idea of, of taking wax and putting it on that charge on the ledger and taking a, a pen or utensil and smearing that wax in to where that charge is now blotted out. And you can't see it anymore. David said, God, I need you to do that with my sin. Will you blot out my transgression? He said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David, he's mentioned three things. He's mentioned transgression already. He's mentioned iniquity and he's mentioned sin. See, transgressions has to do with crossing a boundary that you're not supposed to cross. Iniquity has to do with immorality or some perversion. David did that. Sin has to do with missing the mark. David did that. He said, I did all three of these. And in verse three, he says, for I know my transgressions and my sin. They are ever before me. Every morning I wake up, I can see the sins that I've done. Throughout the day, they're consciously in my mind and weighing down my heart. When I go to sleep, I can't get rest because I know the transgressions and the sins that I've committed, and I can't find any peace. They are ever before me. David, he committed adultery. He committed murder. And according to the law, these two things were punishable by death. If you committed adultery, if you committed murder, then you were to be killed. But here's the, 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 the part of the problem with David's power that led to his perversion. Check this out. There was no magistrate or judge in all of the land that was in a higher office than David. Why? Because David was king. So there's no judge, no magistrate, no official that is higher than him that can condemn him because he's sitting at the top of the ladder. David is king over all of Israel, which means there was no person that was authorized to put him to death for his crimes. So David knew the position that he was in, and David also knew, I can get away with this because I'm the king. Nobody else can condemn me. Nobody else can put me to death because I'm the king. Nobody else is higher than me. David knows his position. Not even the Sanhedrin could condemn the kings. But what David failed to see is that there is a king over his kingship. And David was standing in the direct line of his judgment. And at first, he's oblivious to this, not only to his sin, but also to the effects of his sin. And he thinks he's good because he's covered his trail, right? He's had Uriah killed. He's put things away, and Bathsheba's pregnant. She's getting ready to have the baby, and everything's good. He's made her his wife. So David's thinking, I'm, I'm good. I've covered my trail. But there's a righteous God who sees everything. David is getting ready for a lethal blow, and he doesn't even know it. But thank God for Nathan. Thank God for the person in your life who doesn't care about your status. They don't care about your image. They don't care about how much money you have. They don't care about your prestige. They care about your soul. Thank God for that person in your life who's willing to see through the facade, see through the mess, and get to the heart of who you are. Thank God for Nathan, they are willing to steer you from the grip of the enemy, even if it offends you. See, Nathan's his, his fearlessness and his faithfulness in reproving sin, reproving David's sin, it, it instructs us about the necessity of accountability. No matter how hesitant you might be to provide accountability for somebody, there's a necessity for it. And it is a painful thing to do. But it's better to endure that pain of offending a brother in love than to see that brother or sister be given over to sin. The effects of sin. And if your brother or your sister, they are legitimately calling 
you out for something that they see in you that does not reflect Christ, at the end of the day, you need to be thankful for it. Man, y'all quiet today. Y'all quiet today. You need to be thankful for it. Because the alternate is, is people not caring enough to keep you away from sin, right? And the Bible tells us that in James 1.15, when that sin is full grown, it leads to death. And yes, it, it, it probably will offend you at first or embarrass you at first if your sin is, is seen and revealed and called out by somebody that loves you. Maybe you will be offended when a brother comes to you and says, hey, man, you know, I, I don't think you should be staying at the office that late with that, that female co-worker you have. Or when a sister comes and says, you know what, we, we probably shouldn't be talking about this person because they're not here to defend themselves and we're getting ourselves over in, to gossip, so we should probably stop. Don't despise your humble friends who tell you of your sin. Verse 4 says, against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Now, David here, he says, against you and you alone have I sinned. Now, in, in an objective sense, it wasn't true that David had only sinned against God, right? He, he sinned against a lot of people. He sinned against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against their families, against his family, against the kingdom. And in a sense, even against his own body. But all of that faded into the background as he considered the greatness of his sin against God. Now, God has chosen to link your relationship with him with your relationship with people around you, right? The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. So God has chosen to link our relationship with him or our relationship with each other. However, God is to be central in all things. How does that play itself out? Well, I love you because I love God, right? I, I work hard at all that I do because I'm working as unto the Lord. I lead my kids because I love God. I lead my wife because I love God. All that I do for you as a church, I do for you because I have a relationship with him. So if I sin against you, then guess what? I've ultimately sinned against him. So if I sin against you, then I sin against him. And, and David is, he's not negating the fact that he's sinned against people, that he's sinned against Uriah and sinned against Bathsheba and his family and her family and the kingdom. He's not negating those things. But he's automatically going to the greatest offense, which was sinning against God. That's why David says what he says. And this is what we must bear in mind, those of us that are in a marriage relationship, you have to bear this fact in mind, that the way that you treat your spouse, the way that you love your spouse and respect your spouse is a reflection of how you love God. So the reason that I respect you and love my wife is because of my commitment ultimately to him. Now, listen, we're going to argue, not we're going we gonna to argue, okay? We're going to get after it. We're going to be upset. We're going to throw down sometimes, okay? That's, that's a part of it. But the reason that I come back to my wife, the reason that after I've walked outside for a little bit, I come back inside, I don't get in my truck and go stay in a hotel, the reason I come back is because I got to an answer to him of how I'm treating her. And that ultimately is where the accountability lies. And if I've done something to sin against my wife or offend my wife, I've done it to sin against God. And this is what David is saying. I sinned against God. There's a whole lot of people in, that lay in the, the wake of my sin and my terrible decision. But for me to get it right with you, I got to get it right with him. And this is what David is saying. And he says in verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. He goes all the way back. He says, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David is highlighting the doctrine of original sin. And we see this throughout Scripture in Ephesians 2, 3, and Romans 5, 12, and Genesis 8, 21, and Ephesians 58, 3. There's so many more verses that highlight original sin. He said, I came into this world full of sin. I was conceived in sin, that precious little sweet baby that you love, and that is so sweet, and you get to 
scrub them, and they're so cute. Yeah, that thing is full of sin. It's a little sinner. All right? And you'll find that out in about 12 months. Just keep on, keep on going. But, but we're brought into this world in sin. David says, I showed up jacked up. Okay? But in verse 6, he says, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. David, he did not cry for superficial reform. That he said, I've got to have something deeper to get down in the issues of my heart. And this is where he says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, hyssop was a, a herb or a, um, like a flower or a branch that was used uh, by the priest to actually spread blood over the doorpost for Passover. This is significant in Exodus 12, 22. It was also only used by the priest for purification. So David is doing two things here when he talks about this purging with hyssop. First thing he's doing is he's appealing to God as his high priest. Remember how he said David sat in a seat where there was nobody else above him? Well, David here in verse 7 is acknowledging there is a high priest above me. And I have to give an account to him. And the only way that I can be redeemed of this sin is that the high priest come and pronounce me clean. And he's got to purge me with this, this hyssop. So this is the first thing that he's doing. But he's also saying, God, I surrender to you to do the purging. David didn't say, well, you know what I did was pretty bad, so let me figure out how to get myself clean. Maybe I can work harder. Maybe I can do better, right? That's often our response to sin. we got to work harder. we got to do better. You made a mistake. You sinned. You fell. Hey, just work harder and do better. Well, you've been working harder and doing better for 15 years. Where have you gotten? You've been working harder and trying to do better your whole life. But what happened whenever you sat down and got confronted with the word of God and you said, God, you're the one that does the cleansing. So I surrender this issue, this sin over to you. Purge me by your sanctifying power. Do something for me that I cannot do for myself. And once you did that, once you surrendered, now you've been walking in victory for 15 years because you surrendered. You gave it over to the father. You embrace sincere repentance and you let God's truth do its work in your inward being. Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. See, brokenness is fitting for the believer under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Brokenness is, is the fitting response for the believer that is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I'd write this down if I were you. Brokenness leads to gladness. Brokenness leads to gladness. David said, let me hear the joy of gladness. Yes, it's, it's painful at the moment, but it leads to gladness for a, a lifetime. It is like the shepherd. The shepherd, he's carrying a staff for a number of reasons. He's carrying it for protection. He's carrying it even to prop himself up as he's, he's walking through. But ultimately, the shepherd has that staff. When that sheep begins to get wayward, he takes that staff. And if there's a sheep that continually runs off and runs off, the shepherd will take that staff and he will break the leg of the sheep. And the sheep will fall in pain and in anguish and those bones will be broken. But as a result of that, the shepherd knows that I've broken this leg and I'm the only one that can fix it. And he takes that sheep up and he begins to nurture that sheep, carry that sheep, care for that sheep, feed that sheep, water that sheep. And that sheep becomes endeared to the shepherd, and that sheep learns more and more about the voice of the shepherd. Why? Because he's underneath the shadow of the shepherd, and he's cared for by the shepherd. And that sheep doesn't wander off again. And the reason that he doesn't is because he had an experience of having his legs broke, and the shepherd brought him back to life. In verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Once again, David, he wants assurance that his sins have been erased. He knows that, that even one unpardoned sin is fatal to peace and salvation. If there is one sin that remains on you when you stand before God, you are fatally condemned. 
that he needs mercy to cover all of his sin. So this is what he asked God for in the next verse. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, David wasn't asking to just have his heart improved. He wasn't asking to just have his heart renovated. He wasn't asking, God, will you just kind of amend my heart? God, will you just kind of stitch up my heart a little bit, maybe patch it up kind of here and there? No, he was asking to have a brand new heart. Create in me a clean heart. Create. Create in me a clean heart. This verse, it brings out what had been applied in, 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 in verse 2 and 7. The work of being made new, it must be inward. It's got to take place in the heart. It's got to be thorough, which is why I cannot complete that task on my own. Because if it was up to me to clean my heart, I'd clean some of it. Probably wouldn't clean all of it, right? I, I wouldn't get up under the dresser, and I wouldn't get behind the fridge of my heart. I wouldn't get underneath the couch of my heart. I wouldn't do those things. Because if you want to see where the real dirt lies, move the couch. Move the couch. Because that's where all the old toys are, the old french fries, half-eaten jelly sandwiches. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That, that's where it's at. It's under the couch. And if you want to know how dirty somebody's house is, just move the couch. It's true. So what I'm trying to say is that God doesn't want any half-eaten jelly sandwiches under the couch of our heart. Okay? Does that make sense? That, okay, that's what I'm trying to say, all right? But God, he displays his power by his ability to bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing. In verse 11, he says, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. For him, the whole point of, of cleansing and restoration was to renew his relationship with God. David didn't want a God who cleansed him yet remained distant. He said, God, I, I need you right here. Take not your spirit from me. Father, if you take everything else from me, if you take the kingdom and the money and the clothes and the cars and the resources and everything else, if you take my family away from me, that's all right, because as long as I have your presence, I've got everything I need. I've got everything that I need. Don't take your spirit from me. That should be our prayer. And he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. And he says to sing aloud, great mercy calls for great song. Great mercy calls for great song. Verse 15, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Martin Luther said this. He said, if we have, through faith in Christ, received the righteousness of the grace of God, we can do no greater work than speak and declare the truth of Christ. You can do no greater work than to express to those around you, this is what God did for me. This is how he saved me and extended his mercy to me. In verse 16, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. Now, it's interesting that David says here that you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it, and that you're not pleased with burnt offerings. Now, according to the law, for the crimes of murder and adultery, there was no sacrifice that could be given because the penalty for adultery or the penalty for murder was death. So there's no point in you offering up a sacrifice because you can't be remitted of that sin. You are to die. And David says, in light of the law that I know, God, I can't give you a burnt sacrifice because that ain't going to cut it. Not for what I've done. It, it's not going to cover this sin. So I can't give you that because that's not what you're after. The penalty that I deserve is death. So the question then is, God, what will you accept? Since I can't give you a burnt sacrifice or an offering, what is it that you will receive from me? Don't miss this. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. This is what God requires. And a broken spirit and contrite heart need more than all of these other sacrifices put together. 
God says, I, I need your spirit to be broken. I need your heart to be humble, to be contrite. Because when you present yourself to God in that way, you're coming with a heart that is empty of pride. It's empty of pride. But it projects humility and, and repentance. In Isaiah chapter 1, we see where there's an expression of God saying, I don't want all these sacrifices. I don't want bulls and goats and rams and all this blood. God says, I'm done with that. But what you can do is come to me and let's reason together. Though your sin be as, as scarlet and as crimson, I can make them white as snow. What kind of God is this that would come and say, listen, you've made a mess of things. You've made a wretch of things. But come on and sit down with me for just a minute and let's talk. Because the only solution to all the stuff that you're in is going to be found at my feet. So come on to me. Don't run from me. Run to me. And let's get this thing fixed. God is saying, come to me. And in verse 18, this is so incredible here. He says, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Now, that seems like an awkward turn for David to make because he's talking about a sin and his transgression. Then he starts talking about Zion. This is amazing. When he talks about Zion, Zion is the church. And Jerusalem is another name for the church that parallels with the word Zion. So what David is asking here in verse 18 is, God, look out for your church in spite of my sin. He's saying, God, protect and preserve the church. I made a mess of things. My sin has been egregious in your sight. But God, don't cause the walls of the church to crumble because the walls of my life have crumbled. Protect and preserve your church. Reproving sin and David wasn't just about David. It was about the kingdom of God. David asked God to repair, repair the breaches that his own sin and misconduct had made. Spurgeon said, no man can truly pray for himself unless he prays for the church also. You must pray for the church. And God will preserve his church in spite of the fallenness of man. As I finish this sex this morning, I want to finish with verse 19. It says, then will you delight in right sacrifices and right sacrifices. And after we have approached God with our heart, in the context of the law of this day, David's going, i got to give you my heart, and then we can work from there. Then he says, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. But the, the, the bulls and rams that he's offering after the repentance are just signs of saying, God, you are worthy of the praise. God, you're worthy of all that we have. He's not offering up these sacrifices for the repentance of his sin in that moment because it was his heart that needed to be broken. It was his repentance that was required. And then after that, David comes and he says, okay, now we're going to give more sacrifice to God. But that's where it starts. We must offer up ourselves in repentance and submission and say, God, here am I. Have mercy on me. And as a result of that, God can then work through you and work with you. I'm going to have the prayer team come on up here. With verse 19, we, we see a, a confident conclusion here of what repentance looks like. You know, if we're to be saved by God's mercy, the thing and the response that you and I can have is a confidence in his unfailing love. We've been saved by his mercy. If you are to be saved this morning, it's going to be an act of his mercy and his grace. And once you've been saved by the grace of God, one way we honor him as an extension of his mercy is by walking in confidence in what he's done. We don't second guess it. Well, God, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, you know, uh, I, I, I'm saved, but I made a mistake, so I think i got to start all over again. No, God says, come to me, repent. Yeah, your sins are, are scarlet, like, like red and like blood, but I can make them white as snow. Come to me, come to me. The mercy of God is there. You know, and, and talking about David and just his, his sin, uh, for one, I'm very thankful for the mercy of God that he doesn't display my sin for the world to read for thousands of years like he did David. Y'all good with that too? I mean, we get to see what he's done in, 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 in living color right here, full. 
But you know, I've seen a number of, of preachers fall. I've seen a number of preachers fall into moral failure, into addictions to all type of things. I've seen preachers fall into adultery. I've seen them fall into pride, immorality. And about five and a half years ago, I became pastor of Life Church, and I remember hearing about a, about a moral failure of a well-known pastor. And before I became pastor of Life Church, when I heard about this preacher who fell in, into immorality, my response was, you know what? He got what he deserved. How could he do that to his family? Serves him right. He's obviously disqualified or way different. But now after having been a pastor for almost six years, my response is, it, but for the grace of God, there go I also. It is the grace of God that pulls us together. And every blood-bought believer in Christ should have the same response, that if it were not for God holding us up, as Jonathan Edwards said, we would absolutely fall mercy of God that is holding us together in this very moment. You and I are standing in need of mercy every single day of our life. When we see a brother or sister fall, we don't cast stones, but we cast a hand out to them and say, listen, let me direct you to Psalm 51 because there's somebody that has fallen before and let me show you how he responded. Let me show you what repentance looks like. I just want to direct you to the scripture. I don't want to condemn you. I don't want to judge you. There's a righteous God that sits in that seat, and I don't, but I want to direct you to the scripture, to Psalms 51, and let's see what true repentance looks like. Others might say you've fallen from grace, but if you belong to Jesus, you don't ever fall from grace. You fall into grace because he's always there to catch you. So this morning, where, wherever you find yourself, if you say this, I need to cry out to the Lord. I'm in need of that mercy and that grace. There's somebody here that could pray with you. If you say, I don't even know Jesus, where do I start? They'd love to talk to you about it. If there's other needs in your life, if there's sickness that exists, if there's issues with family, if there's issues at work, if there's things you need to present to the Lord, this is our, our moment to come and to pray with somebody. Or you can pray just mail the altar, whatever you need to do with the Lord, this is, this is the time. So Father, we thank you, God, for the word this morning. Lord, thank you for your extension of mercy that has been applied to us. God, we did not deserve it. We didn't earn it, but we get to enjoy it. And so God, I pray that you would just begin to stir in the house this morning, Lord. Just allow us to see you in the light of that mercy. God, you not for a moment have become a God that is not righteous and not fully a, a justifier of condemning sin. God, you remain the righteous judge, but you've made a way for us to get to you. And there's no other way to get to you except through your son. There's no other way. And so this morning, God, we just want to stop and surrender and say, God, I, I want to continue to walk in your path and your way, God, to continue to say, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew within me a righteous spirit. We cry for mercy. We don't do it according to our works, but we do it according to your abundant, steadfast love. So God, move like only you can. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If y'all would stand with us, come and pray as you feel like.